So I'd, I'd like to welcome everyone to this Ask, APSARD Ask the Experts webinar. Our topic today, as you all know, is going to be telepsychiatry and digital interventions, uh, digital interventions on medication management and therapeutic treatments. My name is Dr. Greg Mattingly. I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar, and I'd like to make a few introductory comments about our faculty. So our faculty today is going to be Dr. Mark Stein. Many of you know him. He is our former president of APSARD. He's director of the ADHD and related programs, the Pearl Clinic at Seattle Children's Hospital, and professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences and pediatrics at the University of Washington. Uh, he is the past president of APSARD and the 2017 recipient of Chad's Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Stein has authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications, an associate editor of the Journal of Attention Disorders and the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology. He's a good friend, he's a good colleague, and welcome back again, Mark. Um, Dr. Sibley, Dr. Maggie Sibley, is a newer friend. Um, so Maggie and I did a presentation for the ADHD World Federation this past summer on the topic of COVID and how it was affecting our families and our children. Uh, we've invited her back to join us again so for a delightful presentation. For anybody that doesn't know Dr. Sibley, she's a licensed clinical psychologist at Seattle's Children's Hospital and associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at University of Washington School of Medicine. Her research focuses on development and testing of effective and engaging interventions for adolescents with ADHD. Uh, she receives grant funding from the National Institute of Mental Health, has authored over 80 publications on ADHD, and has published a comprehensive guide to treating ADHD in teenagers, which was published in 2016. In addition to all those things, Maggie is a wonderful presenter and a great teacher. So I think we're going to enjoy hearing from her. And, and once again, pleased to have both of you join us. Before getting started today, I want to review a few things with you. Down at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see a question and answer session. Please feed me your questions and answers. At the end of a presentation by Dr. Sibley and then Dr. Stein, we're going to have a Q&A session where we're going to have, you know, about 15 minutes to answer questions that you come up with as you watch these lectures. So send me your Q&As and I will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. At this point, I think it's going to be our honor to have uh, Dr. Sibley to begin with our first lecture. Uh, Maggie, if you would go ahead and take it away for us, that would be wonderful. Thank you all for having me. I'm excited to be here and um, present to you all virtually. And my talk today is going to be really focused on behavioral telehealth interventions um, for ADHD and a focus on what the research tells us um, about delivering care over this format. Um, here are my disclosures. I think the most relevant to this presentation is that I get um, book royalties from Guilford Press for a book that um, I'll describe some research from um, that tests the treatment manual that's in that book. Um, so let's just start out with a really basic question. So what is telehealth? Um, and by now, many of us are overly familiar with this, but um, we define telehealth as a two-way real-time interactive communication between a patient and a practitioner at a distant site or between two practitioners. Um, and so there's a lot of different types of telehealth. It can include video conferencing between a patient and a provider. It can be e-visits, which is like using patient portals to be able to exchange information between providers and patients. Uh, remote patient monitoring, like using a wearable device or a smartphone to feed back information to a provider so that they can make clinical decisions. E-consults, which includes allowing um, specialists to communicate remotely with providers in regions where there may not be specialists available. Um, you're seeing chatbots now that can take over some aspects of clinical care. So we're talking about a realm of um, digital interventions that kind of can span different modalities. And I'll be focusing on what's been done so far in the field of treating ADHD um, from a psychosocial approach. Now we all know why we're here today talking about this, and that's because COVID-19 became a major catalyst for a boom in telehealth. And so we found ourselves in a situation where that was the only way we could deliver certain types of care. And this is a, just a chart right off the CDC's website that just shows um, the light blue being last year from January to March, how much telehealth was being utilized and the dark blue is this year. And so not surprisingly, we see a dramatic spike in telehealth utilization. And this chart only goes through the end of March. Um, if we extended that further, you'd continue to see high utilization over um, the last 
nine months or so. So as a result of this, uh, a lot of us had to scramble and we had to think about how we can deliver behavioral health interventions over a uh, telehealth modality. And so I think there's a couple psychological things that happen both to providers and patients when um, this pandemic hit us. One of the things is that I think in general, people are always hesitant about making big changes to how they do things and what they do, right? And so we got forced to do things differently. We got forced to make sure that we didn't um, let there become a gap in care for people. And so we started using telehealth modalities. And in support of all of us, there were regulations that were loosened in order to allow us to uh, provide these services in a sustainable way. So there were loosened regulations with respect to reimbursing um, for telehealth services. We're permitted to deliver telehealth from a broader range of locations than previously may have been permitted. Um, and so one of the big questions I think here that we continue to not know the answer to is what will happen when the pandemic ends. And so one of the things I want to consider today is what do we know about the research on ADHD and telehealth and what do we think will continue after the pandemic in terms of um, being able to optimize the care that we can provide to patients. So. Um, First question is, well, how are behavioral interventions for ADHD delivered via telehealth? What does this look like for those of you who haven't um, done this personally yet? Uh, I just want to quickly go over what the, the evidence base, sorry, evidence base says about um, delivering behavioral interventions for ADHD. And I think it's important to remember that uh, depending on the age of the patient, there's slightly different modalities that the research supports. So with children, we're usually speaking about behavioral parent training or possibly classroom behavior management. Um, with adolescents, we've got a couple models of clinic-based behavior role type therapies that are uh, shown to be effective, including CBT and more behavioral therapy. That's not so much cognitive um, reframing with the kid, but um, using behavioral strategies like parenting contracting between parents and teens. And with adults, um, there's good evidence of the efficacy of cognitive behavioral therapy delivered directly to the adult with ADHD without family members involved. So perhaps some of these um, modalities can be delivered effectively over telehealth. And so I'm going to share with you all to start out a little bit about the research and what has been done in the last essentially seven or eight years to substantiate our ability to start delivering care this way. This is the first study um, that I'm aware of that looked at behavioral parent training for ADHD delivered in a telehealth um, framework. In this particular study, this is very early on in the telehealth sort of trend. And so what they did is they delivered parent training in both situations, the parents were in rooms in a clinic. In one situation, the provider was in the room with them. And in the other situation, the provider pro appeared on a screen and delivered um, the parent training remotely. And you can imagine that this makes a lot of sense if you've got a group of parents in a remote region, maybe in a primary care practice where there isn't a provider who's um, qualified to provide behavioral parent training in person, but they could, you know, remote in and they could work with the group. So I think that's, um, you know, where this particular study is relevant. They delivered um, Barclays Manual Defiant Children um, to the parents. And what we learned from this study is that the treatment was equally effective, whether or not the provider was in the room or on the screen with the family. So this was our first sort of um, litmus test of whether we could deliver behavioral interventions for ADHD over um, a telehealth modality. And I think what we learned is that the telepresence, which is a term that we use in the research to describe feeling like somebody's really there with you or not, did not undermine the ability of the behavioral parent training to be effective. So this is a, this is a good signal for us. Um, we have another study that Mark is gonna talk a lot more about, and I'm just gonna present one brief slide on it. And this is a, a kind of a combined treatment study. So the, these telehealth services in this study included both pharmacological treatment and a behavioral parent training treatment. 
And so the families were either randomly assigned to get the uh, telehealth package, which included telehealth, telepsychiatry and six sessions of behavioral parent training, or to get uh, sort of primary care as usual, which was most, mostly uh, from what I read, pharmacological treatment. And um, I think some of the important lessons out of this study for behavioral interventions is, uh, first of all, engagement in the behavioral part of the treatment was strong. There were six sessions offered and on average families attended five of them. Fidelity was also strong. So the clinicians were able to deliver the behavioral treatment and these were community clinicians. So I think that's a really high bar to be able to cross of being able to train community clinicians um, to do behavioral treatment for ADHD with fidelity. And I think it's pretty, um, pretty exciting that this was able to happen successfully. And what they found was that the telehealth arm of the trial demonstrated better outcomes than the primary care arm. And I think, again, the takeaway here is that we don't know whether the behavioral treatment was the active ingredient in that. But what we do know is that this as a package was an effective way of caring for kids and that people were able to do the behavioral parts of the treatment without trouble over the um, video conferencing modality. So that's, I think, another um, kind of positive signal for us. Um, now I'm going to present you the study that my team did a few years ago. This is in 2017. And what we did was an open trial. So there were 20 families involved, but there was no control group. And we had, we were testing a treatment called STAND, which is basically a parent teen contracting um, for ADHD with some motivational interviewing to engage the families. And um, we've already done a lot of research on STAND. At the point that we published this study, um, we'd done two randomized controlled trials that had pretty um, good effects for ADHD symptoms and impairments. So our job here was just to see um, were there positive signals again, you know, in people's ability to deliver the treatment as providers and the ability of the families to uptake it, to come to the sessions, um, to, to feel like it was a positive experience with them. And then could we get a signal at engaging the same outcomes that we would typically engage in our in-person trials that had shown effectiveness. So that's what we were uh, attempting to accomplish in this study. And so here, um, so this would be the first study that's just a video conferencing um, behavioral intervention. So we don't have any pharmacology involved in this. Um, and we also are doing to home video conferencing instead of having the families in the clinic. In this case, uh, we had most of the families complete all 10 sessions that were offered to them. Um, a few families dropped out very early on. And um, we also had, in, in STAND, we're really focused on getting people to practice what they're learning outside of the session. So here we were able to um, get pretty high hit rates for people practicing the skills, uh, very similar to what we would see in in-person trials. Um, so maybe even there's an advantage there because we're in the homes with people and can help them kind of think about how to, um, how to use what we're teaching them in the context in which they're currently sitting. So that might be a, a plus here. Um, I think it's important to mention that there were some limitations to this approach. So people had privacy concerns. And I think as many of you probably know from delivering telehealth now, you know, that often looks like people, other family members barging in, um, not being sure if you can find a private location in the home, having people call you in the middle, you know, on your cell phone in the middle of the, um, the treatment. This study, we collected the data from 2014 to 2015. So there may have been more tech problems back then than there might be today, because I think our internet technology is getting stronger every year. Um, but it is worth noting that you may lose minutes of treatment time if you're dealing with tech issues and also home disturbances. Um, people getting up in the middle of treatment to go change the laundry or something like that, right? So those are some of the things that maybe create a limitation here. Um, but in spite of those uh, potential barriers, uh, the clinicians who were doing this treatment had high fidelity scores overall, a little bit lower than what we saw in, in person, but certainly high enough to feel like you were doing the treatment with integrity. 
Um, and that goes for both the content fidelity, which is what they talked about, and the process fidelity, which is the, how well and how skilled the therapists use the motivational interviewing skills that they were trained to use. And um, he, something I found interesting was that over the telehealth modality, the parent um, alliance with the therapist was pretty strong off the bat. Um, most of them were, you know, approaching four out of five, three to three point five to four out of five. The adolescents were a little bit weaker at the beginning with their alliance with the therapists over the video conferencing. But whereas the parent alliance stayed the same the whole time over the 10 weeks, the adolescent um, alliance grew over time. So although it may have initially been hard to connect with teens over the telehealth modality, it was possible by the end of treatment to build relationships. And I think that's another important thing for us to learn from this research. And overall, people were uh, largely satisfied with the treatment. Um, maybe a little lower than in person, but not too much lower. Um, and we had, like in our in-person trials, some positive signals here in terms of seeing similar effect sizes to what we had seen when delivering this behavior therapy in person um, in terms of reductions in ADHD symptoms, reduction in organization skills problems, and small improvements in school grades. So we saw similar effect sizes and from there, um, we thought there, this is a, a positive signal and we have no reason to not do this um, because everything checks out okay. This is the most recent study um, of ADHD psychosocial treatments delivered over telehealth that I'm aware of, and it came out just a couple months ago. And um, here, we, this is a similar design to the study I just presented in that there were 20 families. It was sort of an open trial and they were really focused on the same sorts of fidelity and satisfaction type um, metrics. So this was a group parent training delivered over video conferencing um, to the homes of the families. And this was delivered during the pandemic. Um, and what they found was similar to the other trials I presented Fidelity was high, satisfaction was high, and the caregivers um, gave some qualitative feedback. They appreciated especially not having to find childcare while they were receiving the services. So that may be for ADHD treatments a major plus here for the child, at least for the child age group. Um, there were some limitations that they perceived like feeling constrained, sharing personal information in a group setting. Um, inconvenience in particular with the mute and unmute but button like disrupting the flow of conversation um, but overall again they had a positive signal as well so i think these four studies which are probably the most direct tests of a behavioral intervention for telehealth give us a few uh clear conclusions um, first of all it's feasible to convert adhd um, psychosocial treatments to video conferencing platform. Second of all, um, we don't have any evidence to suggest that the effectiveness is reduced, although none of these um, studies really directly tested through randomized controlled trial, the effectiveness of just a behavioral treatment for ADHD. And I think that I'll show a slide on future directions in a second, but I think we also need to think about directly, how does it compare to nothing, but how does it compare to treatment in person? Um, and I think that we do have to think about what works for whom and why. So feasibility might depend on things like technology barriers. Do people have stable internet connection? Are, is this a chaotic home setting where it's hard for families to focus versus quieter settings, people with good internet? Um, they may be better recipients of this type of um, treatment. And I think that we, I think the number one concern people have is alliance. Can we keep people engaged? Can we keep that therapeutic relationship there over video conferencing? And so far we don't have any signals to suggest that it's um, majorly undermined. So that's also positive. Um, open question about outcomes, but no red flags so far. And so I just wanna present a couple more minutes of information specific to the COVID-19 pandemic and telehealth, because I think some people um, may I be right in the muck of that right now. And I think it's worth sharing a few things that I've learned. Um, so back to the research for a second. Um, there has been a few studies looking at how ADHD symptoms are impacted by the pandemic. This is a study um, that is on general youth with 
without necessarily mental health difficulties, but we see that the greatest spike in mental health symptoms among typical youth is in an increase in difficulty concentrating. If that's happening in the general population, we can imagine that it might also be happening for youth with ADHD. And a study out of China supports that. Um, here we see symptoms of ADHD and how they were impacted um, by the start of the pandemic. And we see that um, there are increases that um, symptoms that were reported, particularly when it comes to things like the daily routine and regulation of attention and emotions. And that's children. So you might wonder about adolescents and adults. Um, so I can present some data on adolescents and young adults. I don't have any um, data for older adults or middle aged adults, but um, there was a good article that came out um, in Lancet Child and Adolescent Mental Health at the beginning of the pandemic, kind of putting forth a hypothesis that this adolescent young adult age group might be hit hardest by the effects of the pandemic when it comes to ADHD due to the fact that um, they already are struggling with the lower level of structure in their school environments. They're already struggling to meet the demands of adolescents, which are higher than that of childhood. They're receiving less parental support. They're receiving less teacher support and they have prominent difficulties with things like executive function and motivation. So when you put all that together, um, they may have further to fall during the pandemic. Um, so my team did a small study uh, with about 125 youth with ADHD that we were already following up with as part of a longitudinal study and they were already scheduled to come in so we just asked them some questions about how the pandemic has been impacting their functioning to get a sense of where should we as providers be focusing our treatment um, you know during the months of the pandemic and I think just to cut to the chase the biggest thing we found was that it's not too surprising to see that social isolation was the number one um, presenting complaint of the top problems experienced by, uh, this is about 13 to 22 year old youth with ADHD. So we wonder, I think for me that, that hits me in terms of increasing the risk for depression in teens with ADHD during this time. And given that um, they're also experiencing and reporting a lot of things like boredom, difficulty with motivation, sleep problems, trouble engaging in online learning. To, all, to me, these are potential risk factors, I think, for two things. One, maybe depression and one, school disengagement with, which if the kids are older, if they're in adolescence, if they're in high school, that could be a real um, kind of tricky situation where they have the temptation to drop out of school if it's not going well, if they're 17, 18 years old. So something to keep an eye on. Um, ADHD symptoms appeared to be increasing during the pandemic for this age group in this particular study. So as a result, a few um, specific recommendations could be setting a bedtime and a wake up time each day if you're working um, with kids during this time of pandemic, uh, helping the kids identify strategies to increase their motivation, thinking about antecedent control, how can we reduce distractions at home, helping parents find rewards and consequences to increase motivation. I think behavioral activation may play a role here. So scheduling social interactions, physical activities, things kids enjoy to keep their mood up, to keep them um, moving around every day. Of course, setting limits on screen time, which is hard to do right now because everything has to happen over a screen um, and working on you know, daily routines that include things like positive family time. So just to wrap up, I think there's this open question that we started with about, will we continue this shift to telemedicine, to telehealth for ADHD after the pandemic? I don't know, but I do know a couple things. First, there are some benefits. If you're using, um, if you're a provider and you're using video conferencing to deliver care, um, you've got a couple interesting new features that you can use, like being able to mute people, um, kids in particular who may be being inappropriate and disrupting the group, um, being able to chat for participants to kind of say something to you as a provider in the chat, um, especially in a group setting and not, and being able to kind of selectively control when you respond to things, um, using a poll, um, being able to use breakout rooms or people go into smaller groups and talk with each other. So these are cool features. They could really help, I think, with engagement in some cases. Um, and so I think 
we can be creative. We can maybe enhance our treatments in certain ways with uh, the features that video conferencing gives us. Um, we may solve some barriers to treatment. These are the top four barriers to treatment as, according to a couple of reviews on the topic for ADHD. And I think in particular, these structural barriers are obviously potentially helped by telehealth. And that might include things like driving to the doctor's office, lack of time to have appointments, not letting to sit in the waiting room. Um, but again, we have obstacles and these are field wide. They're not specific to ADHD, um, but we do need to prove that outcomes are just as good with telehealth as they are in in-person care. Um, you know, there are going to be concerns about, is this as profitable to insurance companies? Can we keep the telehealth safe um, from HIPAA violations? Um, can we keep, keep it safe from fraud? And, and can we um, work with stakeholders who might stand to lose from this in order to make sure that um, they're, they can gain from it um, if, if we go in this direction? So I would say the biggest future research directions here are, um, first of all, we don't have any trials if you didn't notice a treatment for adults with ADHD delivered over telehealth. So that's a major um, gap in the research. Um, we need more RCTs that are strong, internally valid comparisons of um, telehealth care compared to non-telehealth care. And also, if we want to be compelling as a field, we have to focus on cost savings and cost benefits because there are stakeholders that have a lot of power and whether we're able to continue to use these modalities that care mostly about costs. So we have to be thinking about what kind of um, impact do we have more broadly from a public, public health um, perspective if we shift to this type of care, including utilization. Um, so how is this impacting cancel cancellations, numbers of appointments made, insurance claims made? Um, these are all important questions that we have to get a handle on beyond efficacy. Um, and I think the last thought is exploring telehealth beyond video conferencing. Um, most of this work has been on video conferencing, but we could be using um, interesting patient monitoring technologies. Uh, we could be thinking about e-visits as a way of helping with care. Um, so there's a lot of different directions I think we could start expanding to. So that's my talk. Thank you all so much for your attention. Just want to acknowledge the funding agencies, the people who've contributed to the research, um, and in particular, the people who contributed to my telehealth study, John Comer and Hype Gonzalez. Um, and here's my contact information if anyone is um, interested in following up with me. And I appreciate your time. Yeah, there was a wonderful article that came out, I think just last week in JAMA that looked at the academic difficulties of grade schoolers and high schoolers across the country. And it looked at the increased mortality rates to be expected, years of mortality due to academic underachievement because of what's happened during the pandemic. And so they looked at the effect in the grade schoolers and the high schoolers, they were expecting between three to 9% more high school students will not graduate from high school as a result of missing classes during the pandemic. There was a study that just came out Monday in Fairfax County, Virginia, a very nice county just outside of Washington, DC. 18% of the high school students had two or more Fs in core subjects and children with special education uh, 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 you know, assignments, special education affirmations, 40% had two or more Fs in core subjects. That's tripled the rate that it was a year ago. So when we think about our patients who come to us that are already academically you know, challenging, that are struggling, that are emotionally challenging, I think these interventions have never been more important. Mark, take us through your research and kind of some of the exciting things you've been working on. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Greg, and thanks, Maggie. Um, just want to uh, highlight some of my disclosures, which um, I don't think are any of them are really relevant to this talk. But anyway, um, I'm going to talk about um, COVID-19 and its impact on ADHD youth. You already heard a little bit of, of that, um, and then address some of the lessons learned uh, the past few months in terms of service delivery in terms of telehealth and taking kind of a broader perspective, um, including uh, uh, aspects such as impact on providers uh, and then looking forward to what we can expect um, and, you know, as, as, we, as we learn more and as this uh, develops. <clears throat> um, Maggie already showed you uh, some of the data about children with ADHD during COVID. Um, with ADHD in terms of their, their symptoms increasing or getting worse. Um, the, the important point I thought um, of the, this Zhang article is that 54% of them actually got worse in terms of their ADHD symptoms. But the idea is that for some people, um, it's actually been better. 
Um, the issue, um, I'm thinking of some of my patients, for example, that were really having a hard time in school, falling behind academically, and now they're in an environment where their parent is monitoring all the, all the time. Um, they're really focused on focusing. Um, and for the first time, the parents are really seeing the things that the teachers see. Um, but I think the issue is that it's uneven in terms of which children kind of receive uh, which intervention. Um, but overall, uh, we're seeing more, more severity in terms of ADHD symptoms and comorbid symptoms that uh, come along with it. Um, this is a recent uh, survey. Uh, this is from uh, util utilization data from uh, Athena Health, um, basically showing that um, more children are being diagnosed with ADHD and continue to be diagnosed with ADHD. If you look here at the, um, the increase, I'm going to show a lot of slides with the kind of the same trend. Um, this is uh, the orange is, is current, current year, COVID year, and then the blue is last year. And you can see last year in terms of number of people re-diagnosed with ADHD uh, was pretty stable. Uh, but with the onset of COVID, we're seeing more uh, people that continue to meet diagnostic criteria for ADHD. Um, we're also seeing more prescriptions, uh, more ADHD prescriptions. Um, this gray line kind of highlights, um, actually what Maggie was showing was the adolescents with ADHD having more attention and concentration problems. And the biggest group uh, that um, received a new prescription uh, was it was male adolescents with ADHD. And you can see this marked increase in the number of them that are receiving a, a, a stimulant medication dose. Um, so, you know, we have this huge problem of more ADHD and more severe ADHD and um, the impact on providers and how to deliver treatment. Uh, telehealth, it's, it's been the perfect storm or the perfect opportunity for telehealth. Um, this is a, a, a presentation uh, that we made at uh, American Academy of Pediatrics um, in terms of our experience at Children's National uh, Medical Center in Washington, D.C. So just interesting, in four years, there were 1,600 telehealth uh, to home encounters, and about a third of them were for mental health. In COVID, the first four months of COVID, we had 45,000 telehealth encounters, um, slightly less for mental health. When we look at the, the diagnoses of the individuals that were receiving it, the ADHD percentage was pretty stable, it was about 13%. But what we really saw a marked increase was anxiety. Uh, again, highlighting the, uh, the increase in comorbid anxiety in, in people with ADHD. So one of the issues in service delivery is, you know, um, is it unequal or is there a change in terms of the people that we see, um, especially when you think about, you know, access to Wi-Fi, at least in the experience in Children's National Medical Center, there wasn't a difference in terms of um, socioeconomic status or race in terms of pre-COVID and post-COVID. So basically the same people that were getting telehealth services um, then are receiving them now. Some qualitative things we heard was uh, the benefits. Uh, people really liked, uh, Maggie called these structural barriers, the reduction in structural barriers. Um, not having to go through traffic uh, or parking. Um, and people feeling like they really connected uh, with their provider in the comfort of their own home, not having the artificial uh, situation of the clinic. Uh, uh, Maggie presented um, some of the research on telehealth. So we're doing it, um, you know, does it work? Um, this is the most comprehensive study that uh, some of my colleagues at uh, Seattle Children's had done. Um, and I think the important thing about this study is in some ways it, it kind of mimics the MTA study. Uh, and it was based on the idea that for many children, combination treatment, combining medication and behavioral parent training um, had, had the impact on the most outcomes. So in this trial, um, which was a fairly large trial of 111 kids in one group, 112 in another, um, it was done in rural Washington areas uh, using many different um, uh, pediatric providers. Um, and it was uh, school-aged children with ADHD. And what they did is they compared uh, this hybrid telehealth um, where the telehealth, uh, the, the uh, uh, 
psychopharmacology was done via telehealth um, in terms of five sessions. Um, and the parent training was done live. So that was the hybrid model. But the supervision and the training of the providers was done um, remotely. And what they did is they compared uh, children that received the, this um, hybrid combination treatment with those that received uh, one telehealth consultation and recommendations made uh, to the primary care physician. And uh, this is a summary of the outcome in terms of ADHD symptoms. Um, and um, what uh, their, their target was 50% reduction in ADHD symptoms. And basically both treatments were effective in reducing ADHD symptoms, but those that got the combination of the telehealth um, medication and parent training um, had the most marked improvement where at 25 weeks, about 20% of them still met full criteria for ADHD uh, in the, the, med, uh, the combination group versus about 40% um, in those that just received the one consultation. But again, everybody did better, which is, is really encouraging, and especially those with comorbidities like oppositional defiant disorder. And then when you look beyond the child uh, to the caregiver, um, the, the, the benefits were more marked um, in terms of uh, caregiver depression, stress, family empowerment, all those things improved much more in those that received the combination treatment. Um, now here are some data from the same study on teacher ratings. And here there was really not a difference between uh, the two treatment interventions. Now, there are always problems with teacher ratings in terms of incomplete data or different years, but, but one of the interpretations is that to really impact school, um, uh, you know, the, the medication consultation arm really had a pretty significant benefit. So now I'm gonna talk about, uh, again, our experience at Seattle Children's uh, with uh, home-based telehealth and just, uh, you know, a few different things have happened this year. Um, so, you know, COVID-19, the first uh, uh, virus um, case report was in January. And then Washington was one of the first states that were hit, um, you know, in late January. Um, and March is really when our department really made a major change uh, in terms of moving to telehealth. Uh, a lot of people worked very hard um, in terms of the credentialing and the training and the moving um, all of our treatment services to telehealth. And by March 20th, 67% of the visits uh, were occurring by telehealth. <clears throat> so this just shows the, um, the difference. So this was the year ago in terms of uh, the number of visits done by telehealth were like less than 1%. And then, um, you know, this spring we got to 98, 99% delivered via telehealth. So huge, uh, huge difference. One of the um, significant improvements was in the no-show rate, um, which was really cut in half with telehealth. So our no-show rate went from an average of about 20% uh, in the year before to 10%. So families are always at home and it's easier to schedule, which is, is great. Um, again, looking at the impact on um, who we're seeing, um, not much of a difference in terms of payer mix. Um, we're seeing a, a, about two thirds commercial and about one third uh, public insurance. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna talk about the impact on providers. So we did a survey where we just asked the providers in our clinic, the, the Pearl ADHD clinic, and the providers felt that the telehealth uh, interventions um, were um, pretty effective. And 90% felt they were the same or slightly less affected to on-site care. And this is a survey of our providers which are, who are psychologists and psychiatrists uh, and nurse practitioners uh, in the Pearl Clinic. Um, they were more divided though in terms of access to our care where actually um, you know, um, several of them felt that uh, we didn't have, people didn't have as much access uh, to services. But overall, families were pretty satisfied with the care that they received. The families did qualitatively report difficulties with connection, 
um, uh, difficulties with um, um, confidentiality. I'm thinking of the families that you know have to leave the house and go out in the front yard, and uh, then there's no service there, or they're they're calling in the car, and all the all the challenges in terms of the distractions at home. Um, but really, the benefits were really significant in terms of scheduling, access to care, um, being more comfortable interviewing a child at home. I love being able to see the interactions between a parent and a child. When I'm interviewing the parent and we ask the parent to give the child something to do while we talk, and you actually see the interruptions and the difficulty settling limits. And it's so different than the artificial situation in the clinic. It is um, stressful though to providers uh, transitioning to be to in between tasks. Um, and then we asked the providers how productive they were. They felt that they were pretty productive in terms of working with families, but more stressful in terms of the excess paperwork uh, that they had to do. Um, and a lot of that was the, you know, the family's not there and then calling them to make sure they had the right Zoom invite. Um, and all those things uh, took longer and were, were stressful. So I, th I think um, um, we're looking at a, a, a book um, and we've just really seen the first chapter. Uh, we're just now looking at the acute effects of COVID-19. And the first chapter suggests that we're seeing more ADHD and increase in severity. Um, we're seeing more stimulant prescriptions in certain subgroups, especially the teenage boys. We're also seeing more mood and anxiety symptoms. And in response, we're seeing a rapid expansion in telehealth. Um, the early returns are that there are some unique benefits. Um, we're seeing the this, this same populations that we were seeing before. Um, the worry though is that we're not seeing those that have the most severe ADHD and those that are most at risk in our underserved communities are probably more underserved. Um, one of the concerns is that um, we really have no data on combination treatment, which is what we think many people need. Um, and we're seeing probably more unimodal treatment, either the behavioral treatment or medication alone. There are also concerns about the sustainability. Um, even though um, people find the sessions valuable, the overall volumes are less um, and the reimbursement rates, um, at least now are lower. Uh, I'm in a, a, a teaching hospital and uh, we're not able to, for example, to charge for telehealth visits conducted by a postdoctoral psychologist. Um, and um, so that really uh, is a, a, a strike against training, which makes it more difficult, uh, even though we need more providers that are trained. I think the next chapter um, is what is the cumulative impact of the pandemic? I'm looking at other tragedies, which are very different, you know, thinking of 9-11 and um, um, you know, hurricanes where people are, are displaced for short periods of time, there are very significant impacts on their, tele, on their mental health and on their academic achievement. Um, we don't, well, this is the first opportunity that we're gonna have data to look at what are the impacts on the impairments that ADHD families have um, in terms of academic underachievement. Um, and, and again, many families with ADHD don't just have one child with ADHD. There's such a high rate of other psychiatric and medical comorbid conditions in families with ADHD. And then we're also seeing this increasing negative health behaviors. It's not just social isolation, it's more sedentary behavior. It's not being able to work out. Um, all the protective factors, the natural protective factors aren't, aren't there anymore. And then how do we adapt ADHD management in this situation? Um, how do you diagnose individuals without, for example, teacher ratings? Um, our treatments, we're revising our protocols. Now we're maybe we're focusing more on, for example, medication treatment during online treatment, um, as opposed to you know, longer throughout the day. But how do you substitute um, activities in the day and, and physical activities? And one of the things about clinics is we're able to coordinate care among disciplines. How does that happen remotely? We don't know. And then kind of the scary thought, not to, to, to be really worrisome, but um, we really don't know anything about um, the impact, the direct impact of COVID-19 uh, on ADHD-like symptoms, on cognitive and behavioral symptoms. 
uh, children being born now? Or, um, uh, and, and how is that gonna be different? Um, lessons learned, uh, you know, from the last pandemic, which was, you know, before my time, a hundred years ago, but really this was instrumental in the development of ADHD, uh, you know, after uh, the encephalitis pandemic in 1919 and 1920, when hyperactivity, restlessness, motor disturbance, and twitching uh, became a syndrome. And then in Europe, uh, Kramer and Palnau uh, really identified hyperkinetic reaction of childhood as a sequela of um, uh, that pandemic. So um, this is an exciting time. We're moving quickly to adapt, uh, but we really have a limited knowledge base. Um, and um, I, I guess the exciting thing and, and the role AppSart can play is disseminating knowledge quickly, um, which I think is um, uh, gonna be helpful to everybody. I'd like to just end by thanking my, my colleagues uh, uh, who are uh, you know, helping in the effort uh, to study uh, effective treatments and the, and the impact. Thank you. One of the things that I see as a particular challenge in the clinical world is right now when you look at a lot of the clinical data sets with Blue Cross, United Healthcare, Intermountain Health, when we talk about telehealth for psychiatry, somewhere between 40 to 60% of visits right now are occurring without a video component. In some of the studies, it shows that the majority of visits have no video component, and the highest rate I've seen is that 40% of the visits have no video component when you look at mental health care across the country. Do you think it's adaptable to do just phone only visits? I know my therapists have had to do that with some of the patients. Um, so how adaptable is this data to a telephone only visit? I know we're not getting all of the feedback, but kind of give us your comments there about how we might use that kind of technology in the real world. Um, well, I, I think, um, again, we have limited data and so we're sort of making generalizations. But um, I think that we, we do have quite a bit of clinical experience using um, phone contact, especially for stimulant medication titration. I mean, there've been a number of algorithms developed where you have an initial visit and you make phone contact and then you try to assess side effects and adjust dosages. And I think you know, many clinical trials have done that for some time. Um, I think, uh, and Maggie can probably comment more on this, but um, for psychosocial intervention, I think it's much more challenging um, to just have the, the audio input. I agree. I think that um, the first thing we would need, the first bar we would need to pass is engagement, whether we can get people to engage at the same level over a non-video um, telehealth modality. And I think there can be a role for things like patient um, follow-up, quick visits, um, you know, I think there could be a role for it, but I don't think it could be a replacement at this point without seeing data for what we can probably do over video conferencing. One of the questions we had that came in and it talked about the role of comorbidity during the pandemic. And I think Mark, one of the studies you showed is that, you know, the interventions where you actually had some of the best benefit was when you had comorbidity involved. And we know that rates of depression, anxiety, insomnia, self-medication are, you know, ubiquitous right now. So maybe your comments about preventing suicide, treating comorbidity, screening for comorbidity on a telehealth platform, if you could give us some of your inputs there. Well, I do think that right now, if more so than ever, um, it's really important to be screening for not just the actual symptoms of comorbidity, but for some of the things that might proceed the onset. Uh, precede the onset of those symptoms. So disengagement from school, for example, do it, having missing assignments, um, having a lot of absences, um, not turning on your video during your school uh, classes, those might all be signs of uh, something you can still prevent, which is, you know, potentially school dropout or, or massive academic um, disengagement. And on the other hand, things like underactivity, um, not exercising, not doing anything socially, um, those overuse of video games, those could all be signs of what's to come with respect to comorbid depression episode coming on. So um, I think we should be all screening for the symptoms, but also for the things that precede the symptoms. Yeah. What, what do you think would happen if we just took kids who were a standard deviation off the norm 
for not turning in their assignments and screen them for mental health issues. The rates would be we, we, astronomical, we know it. Smart um, idea. Yeah, when I turn on my video conference and I see a kid and the first complaint is he's not getting his homework done. And I look at the kid and you can just see there's just depression written all over his face. Um, and I think that gets missed an awful lot these days, Maggie. I think you're 100% right. Mm -hmm. Mark, go ahead. I interrupted you. That's okay. I was just going to say, even before COVID, um, ADHD simplex, someone with just ADHD, was a rare phenomenon. You know, about 30% uh, it's reported, but it seems like, at least our clinic, you know, we hardly ever see anyone with just ADHD. And the big worry is, um, you know, we're treating ADHD as if it's one symptom complex with monotherapy. And we know that, um, especially with comorbid disorders, they're not going to respond to one single treatment. And it's just so difficult in many places to find evidence-based treatment targeting the other disorders. Um, and, and just like, you know, there's been this move to telehealth, maybe this is the time to circle the wagons to look at our healthcare systems um, where we can, can find ways with telehealth to provide more evidence-based services. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that we've noticed in Washington is that now we're able to see people not just in the Seattle area, but for example, I had a patient yesterday in Yakima, which is a, a few hours away, and we're able to provide parent training and medication consultation remotely far easier than we were before. But does everybody have access to those services or those treatments? No. So, so this is the time I think really to try to amplify uh, our reach and especially training um, so that there are more people that can do this. And that's, that's why I think it's really exciting that AppSART is really spending a lot more effort in, in training. And with the upcoming meeting, I think there's going to be some special sessions uh, to bring in new people and to focus on training. Mark and Maggie, do you have any new updates on what we can expect as far as prescribing stimulants via telehealth once the pandemic is over? Do we have any guideposts or any kind of uh, rays of optimism out there about this may continue or what are we thinking? Um, <clears throat> I haven't seen any, any new uh, guideposts other than the European group that has come up with um, you know, some guidelines and saying, you, you know, you're not gonna get teacher ratings now uh, and that parent ratings might be more valid. Um, and then, um, you know, sort of people are, are trying to determine um, uh, moving forward, um, how we should make, how we should do diagno diagnoses remotely. Um, but um, uh, in terms of treatment, um, I haven't seen any new guidelines. Uh, I mean, I, maybe you're familiar, Greg. So the, the closest I've had is David Goodman and I, both on behalf of AppSard, were asked to participate in a, uh, a conference that was put on and it had Mental Health America, it had NAMI, it had a lot of the employer groups, a lot of the key advocates from Washington, D.C. And everybody unanimously was in favor of ongoing promotion of telemental health. And so it was good to see that at least all the advocacy groups were lined up in the same position trying to advocate for this in the future. Now let's hope that becomes policy. Um, I think the things going against us, Maggie, is you know United Healthcare right now, Optum, is developing their own mental health platform, their own telehealth platform. And they keep threatening the clinicians must use their platform in the future. Um, that was gonna start in October. Now it was gonna start in December. I think now it's moved off to next year, but they were mandating for all United Healthcare people, you had to transition to their platform, log into their platform to see anybody with United Healthcare, and they were gonna give lower reimbursement. Um, one of the other questions that came out of the audience was, what do we know about reimbursement? Mark, you mentioned that there's some barriers to reimbursement. Right now, we've been pretty pleasantly surprised by reimbursement. What have we seen as the challenges? What have we seen as the struggles? Maggie, what have you seen for you know, therapy through telehealth? Reimbursement, has it been reasonable? Has it been okay? How's it been for you? Well, we can speak to Washington State, which is, um, you know, Basically, we're able to bill the same way that we had been billing for in-person visits, but I know that um, that's not uh, necessarily happening universally. Um, but I do think there is a threat long term that eventually that may no longer be able to happen. And if that is no longer able to happen, if telehealth is being reimbursed at lower rates, 
then the incentive structure for using it changes. And um, you know, the reason it's being built potentially could be built at lower rates makes a little bit of financial sense. You don't need a building. You don't need a, necessarily a person to check people in. So the overhead associated with telehealth is lower. Um, then again, does that incentivize um, organizations to deliver it if they're getting a lower reimbursement for it? I think it all comes down to the math. So that'll be what I think is interesting to watch unfold moving forward. One, one of the positive things is that some of the credentialing and licensing issues have been relaxed, at least uh, for medication providers. Um, so, you know, you, you, you used to be able to only um, uh, prescribe in the state you were licensed. And, uh, and, and so now there's broader reach, but that hasn't been extended for psychologists. Um, and so for example, if I have a patient that's in California, I can't provide telehealth services to them um, now unless I'm licensed in California. And, and that seems to be uh, uh, particularly restrictive. Mm -hmm. No, that's an interesting aspect. I hadn't even thought of Mark. You're right, so that's another place when we think of advocacy for this. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions that come from the two of you? Questions that kind of, when you think about the future of this and how we can use it to our advantage, places to be careful. And Maggie, when I looked at your studies on engagement, I, I was struck by that for a lot of my patients, engagement has been very good. Um, but there have been certain patients it's really been a challenge. Mm -hmm. Some of my patients that have high functioning autism or Asperger's, the engagement there can be quite difficult. But for some of my patients with social anxiety, they've done really well through telemedicine. You can tell them, they say, I feel safer with this. I feel more comfortable. It's a leisure to find my words and talk to you when I'm sitting here in my own comfortable house and my couch and all those things. And Maggie, this is a story you'll probably love. Probably my favorite session I've had through telemedicine during all of this was a young boy who has ADHD plus high functioning autism. And I had a session in his treehouse. Hmm. And I'd heard him and his dad talking about building this treehouse, but at the beginning of the session, dad said, hey, would you like to see Tom in his treehouse? I'm like, sure. And it was by far the best session I've ever had with Tommy. He showed me his house. We talked about challenges. We talked about school. We talked about friends. We talked about his parents. We talked about all kinds of things. And I'm sure it's because we were there, we were in his treehouse. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we're all going to learn lessons about where there's challenges. We're going to learn lessons where this is really good. One of the things that maybe you two with your research background, thinking about, you know, as we look at telemental health, how do we identify the patients that are gonna be well engaged versus those that maybe it's not the appropriate? So when we start looking at these hybrid models, who do we kind of steer them down the telehealth lane and who do we say, listen, I need to see you in person with your set of issues or your personality structure or your family dynamics, I need to see you in person. Cause I don't think we have real good guidance right now about how to go which way when we talk about our patients. Yeah, that variability is clear, though. I can speak to the fact that we're running groups at Seattle Children's right now where there's a parent group and a teen group, and the parents are engaging excellently, um, whereas the teens are really hard to engage in that format because um, they're alone in a room and they can switch to other browsers much like they do during the school day. And so um, even just you know the developmental level of the person um, and some of these broad brush strokes characteristics can really define, I think, who's who's best for the care beyond just individual, you know, differences between people. Mark, any final comments before we close it up for the day? Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I, I just think that um, it's impressive the way uh, mental health providers have stepped up to the plate and trying their best uh, to confront these challenges these changes to, to do service delivery. I mean, this is an incredible stress and strain on everyone. And um, I, I've just been um, really impressed by how everyone is trying to, to adapt uh, during, during this time, which is impacting their families as well. Um, and um, I guess it's just the other thing we haven't talked about schools, but one of the advantages of telehealth, uh, for example, I had a school staffing today on Zoom and uh, it's much easier now to, to have an IEP meeting. I tell people I'm available between seven and 8.30 on Tuesday for a school conference. And I think that's a way to have an impact and to try to push schools, especially for children that need to be seen in person, like you know, a five-year-old with ADHD or high functioning autism, um, they're not gonna benefit from remote learning. 
and we just need to advocate to get, get them in school. Well said. So let me thank all the members of AppSard for joining us. Let me thank uh, Mark and Maggie for being our, our you know, faculty here for this conversation. Let me just send a shout out to everybody. This is a time to take care of our family. This is a time to take care of our staff. It's a time to take care of our patients. It's a time to think about our own resilience. So think about the things that you can do to foster your own resilience, exercise, connection, a sense of purpose. Join us for our next Ask the Experts webinar or join us this year at our meeting in January. Look forward to seeing everyone. Thank you, take care.